knowing that our numbers would be down tonight, I decided I wouldn't preach the same kind of sermon I'd been preaching. And Kevin, you've got the night off, okay? I thought about putting 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 on the screen, and yet I want us tonight, how many verses in the Bible can you quote? I want us tonight to memorize seven verses in the Bible. You think we can do it? Now, get your Bibles out. Get that few Bibles out. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, we're going to memorize some verses tonight. And uh, I just want to see how well we can do it, all right? And here's where we're going to do it. We're going to start. How many of you were born in January and February? How many? Hold your hands up. Come on, there's more than four people born then, I'm telling you. January and February, you've got to memorize the first verse, all right? I want us to talk about the short verses in the Bible. I remember growing up at the West Huntsville Congregation, we had uh, Sunday school on Sunday morning. We had Sunday school Sunday afternoon at, uh, before we had evening services. And the large classroom, and I was in, I was in, the, in the classroom with the college-age kids, sort of the way I remembered it. And you started that class off, everybody had to quote a verse. And so I was trying to find all of the short verses in the Bible. You know, you know John eleven thirty five. 35, do you not? The short verse there, Jesus wept. That's one of the, but you know, unless you're sitting on the front row and they started on the front row, that verse was gone. So, so I, I took it on as a project to find every short verse in the Bible. You know, I'm the only person I, on earth that I know that can quote Acts chapter eight and verse eight. There was great joy in that city. That verse has only one purpose, and that is so Dan can quote a verse that, that nobody else in that, in that, in the, and then I found these verses in 1 Thessalonians. I want you to look at this. There are some amazing, amazing thoughts in these short verses that, uh, that Jim read to us. You, you look at the first one, and if you're born in January and February, your job tonight is to memorize the very first verse, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 16. Now, you think you can handle that? It is a two-word verse in the Bible. Rejoice always. The old King James says evermore, and I memorized it way back down when I was a kid, and I may say evermore a couple of times tonight. Rejoice always. You got that in your heart? you got it in your life, that, that, that's really, thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against you. Rejoice always. I want you to stop and think about it. There's a difference in being giddy and happy, but there is a joy that Christians ought to have that nobody else has. The Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy. Right after, right after agape love is that matter of joy. Holy Spirit working in your life is going to produce joy in your life. Uh, do, you, do you know this verse, Philippians 4 and verse 4? Uh, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say, that's another short verse. So if you go to, ever go to West Huntsville Congregation 60-something years ago, that's my verse. You're not, you're not welcome to have Philippians chapter 4 and verse 4. But I want you to think about it. How can you always have joy? Not everything that happens in your life brings joy. Is that right? You know, and yet the Bible says, and, and this is not memorization. This is harderization. I just made up that word, but you understand what I'm trying to say? Write this on your heart. Rejoice always. What are you going to do when bad stuff happens? How are you going to handle the fact that, that, that bad things do happen to good people? You know, there are those that we love that die. There are those times when we lose our job. There are those times whenever, uh, you know, our parents disappoint us or our children disappoint us. You know, uh, do you know James 1? My brethren count it all joy. That's almost like rejoice always, isn't it? Count it all joy when you fall into temptations, into different temptations, knowing this, what? The trying of your faith brings about patience. And let patience keep on and you keep on bearing up under that 
and the fruit of all of that is that you will be complete, perfect, lacking in nothing. You know, uh, you know how you learn the word hot? There's not, there's not a one of you that inherently knows what the word hot means. You just don't know. And I'm not sure what you touched. But I'll guarantee you one of the early words in your vocabulary when they were trying to get you to say mama and daddy, all of a sudden, don't touch that, it's hot, it's hot, it's hot. What'd you do? You touch it. And then, depending on how dumb you were, about third time, no veil, you'd get it, right? I mean, that coffee pot is hot. The old pot bellied stove was hot. You know, um, that, that, that's an amazing, an amazing concept of learning all of these things. But you learned your lesson. And you are a better person tonight because you know the word hot. Guess what? You did the same thing your parents did and you tried to teach your children the very same thing. Because you see, what you have learned from adversity puts you in a position to help others who are in the midst of adversity. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 says, The God of all comfort has comforted us in order that we might comfort others. And because we've touched a hot stove and God's comforted us, then the Lord says, now you'll be able to comfort others. When my father died, my mother, my dad died at age 56, and my, my mom was a relative young widow, not terribly young. She was older than my dad, but, uh, you know, 60 is not all that old, if you stop and think about it, 58, I guess, whenever, whenever dad died. She died two years later. You know what she said? At the funeral home, people came and said, I know, I know what you feel like. And she says, you don't have a, she said, I thought, you don't have a clue where my heart is. But there was one group of people that could come to that funeral home and say, I know what you're going through. I see the Leros here tonight. Somebody has a child to die and they come to Dan to get comfort. I'm not, I'll say, I can't do it. But Richard can. Why? He knows what it's like. Lost a child. And you can say to that other individual, I've touched that hot stove and let me tell you, let me tell you. And so even when bad things happen, why do you sing? If any is merry, let him do what? Let him sing. Do you know of anybody singing in the Bible at midnight? Huh? Acts chapter 16, where are they? Oh, they're in the church building, air conditioned church building with padded pews. That, you know, they got it all together. The whole church is assembled there and man, everything's going great. Had record attendance, 42 baptisms that day, a marvelous, wonderful day. No, they spent the day, they've been beaten, their backs are bloody, they're in the inner prison. They're down in the inside of the prison. Their feet are in stock so they cannot get out. The chains are there, the, the doors of the prison are locked and at midnight, these guys are rejoicing Always. You January, February people got that? Rejoice always. January, February, what about March and April? March and April. Well, wonder, wonder what this next verse is. Pray without ceasing. You know that one, do you not? 1 Thessalonians 5, 17. Look down at verse 25 and there's another short one. I tried to get that one moved up, but they wouldn't move it up. Brethren, pray for us. You know? And so I knew both of those. If somebody got 517 that, that when I was a kid growing up, quoting that, I got verse 25, brethren, pray for us. Had no idea what it was all about, just trying to, just, just trying to find verses in the Bible so I'd look smart. And that's hard to, when, you, when you look like I look. Anyway, pray without ceasing. Does that mean I've got to be praying right now? Is there a difference in praying continuously and praying without ceasing. Yeah, there's a difference. Do you eat without ceasing? <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Some of us do it better than others, Noel. <laughs> Some of us do it better than others, but we eat without ceasing, do we not? Oh, yes. How many, how many days in your life have you gone without, without eating? Uh, I don't know many. 
How many days have you gone in your life without eating two meals? About the same number, you know. You understand what I'm talking about? Pray without ceasing. You see, the Bible talks about at the end of your giving of thanks, someone ought to say amen. 1 Thessalonians 4 and verse 16 says you're, you're leading a prayer and you get to the end of it and you say amen. Oh, no, no, you got to keep going. Why? You got to to pray without ceasing. No, we live in a world where where there are demands upon us and you cannot pray continuously. But you can pray without ceasing, can you not? And, And I would encourage you as a child of God and especially as you get older, as, as, as you understand the seriousness of it, that prayer become a part of your life. Do you know two characters in the Bible who prayed three times a day? You know, there are two of them. One of them has my first name and that's David. And the second one has my second name, Daniel. What about you? If the man that had a heart like God, a man after God's own heart, if he prayed three times a day, and I don't think he's talking about breakfast, lunch, and dinner, I'm sorry, but as a part of their life, they prayed. Child of God, you have not because you ask not. Isn't that remarkable? There are blessings that God is ready to pour out upon you and you don't have them. Why? Haven't asked for them. That's an amazing concept. And so, and we almost made this next verse one to memorize in everything give thanks. Uh, For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. In everything give thanks. There's that rejoicing always, isn't it? Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks because... It is the will of God that you pray. Sometimes we say, well, if it's the Lord's will, we'll do this. You know, it was God's will. Guess what God's will is? That you pray without ceasing and that you give thanks for everything. That's amazing. Pray always. Or pray without, or rejoice always, pray without ceasing. What sort of mottos for your life? Would, 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 would this be a good thing to write on your heart and a good change for you to make in your life? Uh, David, one of the things I've done when I've, haven't, I find myself not praying like I, like I ought to, I take my watch and put a big P, just put, put a marker and put a big P on my watch. You know why? You know how many times today you look at your watch? Uh, I don't know what you'd put on a cell phone with all the watches that are there, you know, but, uh, but, but some way, something that would trigger in your life, pray more. Think it'd change you? As a man thinks in his heart, so is he. What if I'm praying without ceasing? What if I'm mindful throughout the day about God and, and it is the will of God that I pray. We're not talking about predestination. You know the story about, I mean, the Bible talks about the fact that the, go to now ye that say today or tomorrow we'll go into such a city and buy and sell and get gain. Whereas you ought to say, if the Lord will, we'll do this. I think of a story Hardiman Nichols told. Hardiman's preached here several times and Hardiman used to call an older brother out in Texas and they were going to eat lunch tomorrow and Hardin would say, yeah, I'll meet you there if the Lord's will. And the older brother would say, I don't think he'll mind at all, okay? (laughs) So if the Lord's will, you ought to pray without ceasing and give thanks, and I don't think he'll mind at all. Pray, rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. Well, that's March and April. Got anybody here from May and June? Look at the next one. The old King James says, quench not the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. Weird. Sort of a weird kind of language found in the Bible. Put it, first of all, put it in a New Testament concept. A uh, a context, I mean. Look at the next verse. Quench not the spirit. 
Do not quench the spirit and do not despise prophecies. Where did prophecy come in, come from? Holy men of God spake as they were what? Moved by the Holy Spirit of God. In that, in that early church, in the absence of the Bible, there were, in, in the absence of, in a, using accommodative language, in the absence of an inspired book, there'd be an inspired man. And so there'd be that individual that would get up and he would preach. Guess what one of his sermons would be? Oh, I think I know one they could preach. Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. In everything give thanks. Where did the words of the Bible, where did those words come from? Well, holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Spirit of God. How would I quench the Spirit then? Well, on a personal level, I could put the fire out inside my heart that the words of the Spirit has burning. Trying to make an uh, English accommodation on the word quenching. Here's a fire that's raging. And you pour water on it. What happens? You quench the fire. And so the Bible says, don't you quench the Spirit. And, and I'm, I don't understand everything that's involved in all of the words, but I put this in a New Testament setting and here would be that individual up and the Holy Spirit giving him the very words that were being said. And I thought, I don't want that. What have I done? The Holy Spirit of God wanting to change me to make me be a better person. That's remarkable, isn't it? wanting me to be a better person and the Holy Spirit of God having a message that will help me to grow and to be everything that God wants me to be and the Holy Spirit of God gives that man those words that would change my heart and change my life and I just, okay. You think you could do that in the 21st century? In the absence of an inspired man an ordinary uninspired man has an inspired book and he stands up and he says, rejoice always. And you think, I'm not going to do that. In a recent study, the lady said to me, as we read a verse in the Bible, well, I've certainly got a problem with that. She didn't agree with what the Bible said. She already had her mind made up about what she wanted to do. Read her the words of the Lord. I made no comment at all. I just said, read, read this verse right here. And she read the verse and she said, well, I got some real problems with that. <laughs> Bless her heart. <laughs> this old boy from Georgia, I'm telling you. You know in the South, when you say bless your heart, you can say anything you want to about anybody. She's married to the, uh, or he's married to the ugliest woman on earth. Bless her heart. <laughs> That's the ugliest baby I believe I've ever seen. Bless her heart. You know, well, 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 well bless his, or bless her heart. She's married to, to the worth, most worthless man on earth. Bless her heart. I don't know how we got over there, Nobel. You got me all chasing a rabbit there. I just, <laughs> you stop and think about it though. Here is that individual who says, reads the Bible and she said, I got a problem with that. Bless her heart. You understand? She's standing at the foot of Mount Sinai, figuratively speaking. And the voice of God shakes that earth and said, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Well, I got a problem with that. Quenching the very message of God. Folks, 
let's never, ever have a heart that reads something in the Bible and says, well, I don't believe that. I just stand amazed sometimes. I just don't believe that. You see it sometimes in the church sometimes, talking about withdrawing fellowship. And somebody says, well, I don't agree with that. What are you doing? You're not disagreeing with some, some uh, sermon that's being preached. Not, not gre- disagreeing with some decision an elder has made. Well, I got a problem with that. I'm not going to listen. Cornelius said it, did he not, in Acts chapter 10? Whenever Peter walked into the house, there's Cornelius and he has his family there. He has his friends there. And they, here's what Cornelius says. We are all gathered here together. Do you hear the words you have from God? See the difference? One attitude is I'll read it and I'll pick and choose. And if I don't like it, I got a problem with it. And the fire that the powerful words of the Spirit is trying to put in the heart of that individual. I don't, I'm not going to do that. I don't believe that. I just, I, just, I just don't agree with what the Bible says about, and you fill in the blanks. Think about what's happened in America. Could the Bible speak any more plainly than it does about moralities, about faithfulness in marriage? Well, I don't believe in that. Could the Bible be more plain when it says, the two shall be one flesh and what God has joined together, let not man put asunder? Well, I don't believe in that. The Word of God trying to get people to be happy and they quench the Holy Spirit of God. You got that one? January and February, you got it? Rejoice how, how much? Always, Okay. Pray how much? Pray without ceasing. You, have you memorized two verses already? <laughs> Rejoice always. Pray. pray without ceasing. In yes. everything give thanks. Well, you know, so is the will of God in Christ for you. But well, that's not our memory verse. We're looking for the short ones, uh, Mary, not the long ones. We're, try, we're, try, we're, we're trying to accommodate the audience we have here tonight. And so if it's got more than three verses, three words in it, we're probably not going to memorize it, okay? Pray without ceasing. Quench not the Spirit, or the New King James, do not quench the Spirit. Look at the next one. Do not despise prophecies. And these two probably ought to be together if you were trying to put the verses that may be on the same topic. But let's take this in a different way. Do not despise prophecies. In the church at Corinth, they had a problem. There were those in the church at Corinth who had the ability to speak with tongues and they thought that the whole church service ought to be designed so that all of those who had that miraculous gift of speaking in foreign languages would be able to stand in spite of the fact that nobody would under, almost nobody would understand what was being said and to spend the whole service and they'd rather have the, the matter of tongues than to have prophesying. We have any of that in America? I'm not talking about uh, that aspect of that, though the, the charismatic movement in America glorifies tongues far above prophecy. But I want you to stop and think about how profitable is it for there to be chaos in worship as entertaining as it might be, as appealing as it might be to the, to the fleshly side of me to hear all of these people speaking in tongues rather than speaking the message of God not in an unknown tongue, but in a known tongue. See if I can say it this way. And I say this not to glorify any individual as a preacher, but to glorify preaching. I want you to see the difference. In every act of our worship, it's us. I pray, I sing, I commune, I give. 
And all of that starts in me and goes upward. You know what preaching is? It's the one time in our services where God speaks. That ought to tell us something. It ought to tell us about the kind of preaching that we need in the church. And for us to despise and and to not understand the seriousness of that is for us to have a wrong attitude toward. Cornelius says, we're all here to find out what God wants us to do. We need to sit at the feet of those who have sat at the feet of Jesus. And as Paul said, we plead you in Christ's stead to the world be reconciled to God. God had one son. He was a preacher. You know the sermon he preached? Be reconciled to God. But Christ is not here. And so we stand in the place of Christ and we plead with the world. We plead you in the place of Jesus Be ye reconciled to God. That's May and June, right? Despise not prophecy. Or have I messed it up already? That's July and August, I guess. Despise not prophecy. The next one, we're going to give you two of them. No, let's make it one. July, what about September, October? I've got, what have I got? July and August, September, October. Okay, that'll work. Test all things. What does that mean? It means God gave us a brain. And God expects us to test all things. I like the old King James when it says prove all things. Put it to the test. One of the rules about how we can keep from being led astray is this very rule right here. I'm not going to believe a single thing that he says unless the Bible says it. What a great rule to live by. We talked about the matter of what the Bible says about marriage. Well, well, is that just Dan talking or is that God saying? I need to test and find out if that is true. I sit in a Bible class and I hear something. Well, is that in the Bible or not? I need to be the, have the kind of heart that wants to find out what God says. And so I test it. You know about the Bereans, do you not? Acts chapter 17, the apostle Paul was preaching. Who's this? The apostle Paul. And he gets there and, and Acts chapter 17 says that these Bereans were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word with readiness of mind and skirt and search the scriptures whether those things were so. Don't you ever believe a word that Dan Jenkins says? Don't you never, don't you ever believe a word that David Sproul says without testing it? Don't believe it. Now, if it's right to test the Apostle Paul, and they were called noble because they were searching the Scriptures, whether those things were so or not, then ought we not to be equally noble and to test all things? And then he says, hold fast to that which is good. Will that get us November and December? Test it. And when it passes the test, you grab a hold of it. And don't you let it go. I remember the first time I saw a snapping turtle. I remember what my uncle said. Don't you get your finger in that snapping turtle's mouth. Because he won't turn a loose until till it thunders. <laughs> Until it thunders. I believe that, by the way. (laughs) But that's what it means. If it's truth, November, December, hold fast to that which is good. 
September, October. Test all things. November, December. Hold fast to that which is good. That's, that's a sermon in and of itself, isn't it? But don't you turn it loose. They put a gun to your head. And they say to you, I'm going to ask you a question. If you answer yes to that question, I'm going to pull the trigger. Do you believe Jesus is the Son of God? The moment you say yes, you're dead. What's it going to be? Well, what's it going to be is if you pull that that trigger on that gun. I know what I'm going to do. Now, if you don't pull the trigger, I may live. But if you do pull the trigger, guess what? I get to see Jesus before you do. And he'll be glad to see me. You have, are you that devoted to truth? Folks, you cannot give it up. This thing that David's been teaching on Sunday night about understanding the Bible in God's way. Whenever we understand the Bible and interpret the Bible in the way that God interprets it, grab a hold of that and don't you turn it loose. Why? Because it's good. And you tested it, test all things, prove all things, hold fast to that which is good. And now the seventh thing in here is something for everybody that was born before the year 2011. If you're born after 2011, you don't have to memorize that last verse. Abstain from every form of evil. There's your rule to live by. The old King James, we've heard it quoted so much, abstain from every appearance of evil. Folks, if it looks evil, if that's the form of what it is, abstention. Isn't that amazing? In our talking about sexual morality, and so in our school, we don't, we don't want to teach abstinence. And yet that's the very word used from the Bible. There are things that are obviously evil. Abstain from fleshly lusts that war against the soul. The soul. I asked Hardeman, Nichols one time, Hardeman, what's the strongest verse in the Bible against drinking? And a preacher much older than I am, if they're said, abstain from the lust that war against the soul. That's pretty good. Fruit of drinking? Oh, you see it all the time. War against your soul? Yes. Does it war? Does this war against the soul? Yes. What's my relationship to it? Abstain. Abstain from every form of evil. Seven statements in the Bible. Have you memorized any verses tonight? Don't go back to West Huntsville. These are all mine, okay? But if you happen to sit in the row in front of me and you wanted to say a verse that had the word rejoice in it, have you memorized that verse tonight? Have you mem Not just January and February. Have you memorized it? Rejoice always. Did you write it on your heart? Pray. You got that one? I'm not talking March and April. I'm talking about you. Pray without ceasing. That's amazing. Three words, pray without ceasing, totally changes your life. Quench 
not the spirit. Do not quench the spirit. If God is trying to change your heart, if the voice of God through the words of God are trying to make you to be a better person, don't you quench the spirit. And despise not what? Do not despise prophesying, prophecies. That's, that's pretty easy. Test how much? All things. Hold fast to what? That which is good. And abstain. Can I read you the verbs? Rejoice. Pray. Quench not. Despised not. Test. Hold fast. Abstain. Seven or six verses you've memorized tonight. If I were you, not because you may be in a Bible class where you've got to find the short <laughs> verses, I would sort of mark this whole section right here. What if I took all seven of these and this week I thought, I'm going to teach, I'm going to think Monday about the first one, Tuesday about the second one, Wednesday about the third one. I'm going to meditate on this this week. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Now, if you don't do that, you can be worldly. You can live an ungodly life and live an immoral life and go to hell. Bless your heart. <laughs> Seriously, though, you can take these words from God and write them on your heart. And then you can't say, well, I don't understand the Bible. Pray, rejoice, quench not, despise not, test, hold fast, and abstain. We know the words. Let's put them in our lives. I'm glad you're here tonight. And I hope that this different kind of a Sunday night service from what, we, from what we oftentimes have on a Sunday night is the kind of thing that you'll take something out of this building with you. Pray without ceasing. Rejoice always. Got it? Quench not. Despise not. Test. Hold. And abstain. Write them on your hearts. And now we come to that part of our service where we sing an invitation song to provide an opportunity for people to change their lives. If you're not a Christian, you need tonight to hold fast to that which is good. You know what's good? You know what you need to test? You need to test what the Bible says about faith. He that believeth not shall be damned. Can you test that? Understand that? What about what the Bible says about repentance? Except you repent, you'll perish. What does it say about confession? Whoever confesses me before men, him will I confess before the Father. You testing that? What about being baptized? Arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Can you test that? Then if it passes the test, hold on to it. And if you're not a Christian, become a Christian tonight. The verse that applies to most of us here tonight is the other one, though. Be thou faithful unto death, and I will give you the crown of life. You want to test that? Hold on to it if it's what God wants you to do. If there's any way you need to respond to the invitation won't you let it be known by coming to the front right now as together we stand and sing.